I'd like to begin with, with, with a story. We're going to talk about leading after the example of Jesus. But uh, before we do that, I have a little story I'd, li I'd like to tell. And it's about an abbot and a novice monk, uh, Brother Simon, who uh, were traveling between two monasteries. And it was a long distance, so they had to stay out uh, in the field overnight uh, on their journey. And so they uh, find out, they find where they're going to spend the night. They pitch the tent and get ready for bed, and both of them are, are asleep in the tent. But, but during the night, they both woke up about the same time. And the abbot says, um, uh, Brother Simon, he said, look up to the sky and tell me what you see. And Brother Simon said, well, uh, astronomically, I see countless heavenly bodies. Um, astrologically, Saturn is in the eye of Leo. Uh, chronologically, well, it appears to be about three in the morning, thereabouts. He said, uh, theologically, I see the beauty of God the Creator revealed in his universe. Uh, meteorologically, I think we're going to have a, a nice day ahead of us. After finishing all that, the abbot said, well, Brother Simon, you know very much, but you've learned nothing. The fact that you can lie on your blanket and see the stars tells us that someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> it's all about perspective, huh? Uh, and that's really uh, what I'd like us to think about. What is our perspective on leadership? How do you think of it? Who exercises it? Do you have any? In what way do you have it? How do you exercise it if you have it? So I'd like to begin with a little quiz. And the first question that I'd ask everybody to think about is, what motivates someone to want to be a leader? What do you think motivates most people who are leaders? I'm not going to, because of time, just get some ideas in your mind or jot something down. What motivates people to want to be a leader? I think as we think about some of those qualities, there, there are positive and there are negatives. Huh? Um, some may really want the challenge that leadership presents. Uh, some are just take charge persons and they don't like others to be telling them what to do, so they want to uh, set the direction. Some have a great desire to be a solution to the problems, to solve whatever is going, or at least to improve a situation. Those can be great motivators. On the other hand, there can be some negative motivators. Huh? Some people just want some power. Uh, they want recognition. Um, they want to control. These are also motivators for leadership. Now, a second point to our quiz is, think to yourself again, what are some of the personal qualities of someone who is or has been a leader in your life? What qualities did he or she possess that you would consider them a leader? What were some of their personal attributes? Some typical answers to this, those people that we would acknowledge were leaders in our lives and some of their qualities usually are things like an openness. They were caring about those that they were leading. A good listener, patient. They gave their time to those who were under their charge. They stretched you in a positive way made you more than you might have wanted to be on your own. They placed confidence in you and your talents, uh, respected you and shared the things that you were interested in, and your ideas. Those are usually some of the qualities that are given regarding those who we acknowledge in our lives as leaders. The real question then is, am I a leader? Am I a leader? And Let's get some of the presuppositions for this presentation together. First of all, I want to say that leadership happens whenever I influence another person's thinking, their behavior, their growth, their development. Now, obviously, these can be influenced in a negative way or a positive way. We're hoping for a positive influence on another person. That's a general perspective on leadership. Huh? Secondly, the greatest leader role model of all times is our Lord. 
And that's where we're going to spend our time looking at the example of Jesus in terms of his leadership in the Gospels. But this is the second premise for this morning's presentation. The third is that servant leadership, and that's a phrase we're going to look at, is the only approach to leadership that Jesus validates in the Gospels. We'll look at some quotes. You know that to be true, though, that servant leadership, not those motivated by control or power or glory, but those who are willing to serve are only those who can lead for the sake of Christ's gospel. And finally, that effective leadership begins not necessarily with skills and personnel, but within our hearts. To be a servant leader is a matter of one's heart, whether that leadership is exercised in a home or where it might be. Our Lord clearly and consistently modeled leadership as service. And I will say this about uh, the kind of leadership that our Lord holds out for us to imitate. And that is that if service is beneath you, then authentic leadership is beyond you. If service is beneath you, if you're not willing to be the foot washer, in every situation in which you have the capacity to lead, if you're not willing to be a service, then authentic leadership is beyond your capacity. You'll be some kind of a leader, but authentic servant leadership is beyond you if your heart is not willing to be a serving one. And so there are different types, of course, of classifications of, uh, of leadership, and I'd just like to look at, at these three. First of all, there is what all of us have here, and uh, especially uh, those of you in family situations, is, is leadership that comes from your life role. This is an enduring kind of leadership. It's not temporary, but it, it, it endures, it's permanent, and it's the leadership that you have as husband, uh, that you have as father, son, brother, all of the relationships in life, the life roles that we have. Um, uh, and also I put there parishioner. You might not think of that as a life role uh, leadership, but it is um, because we consider our parishes a family of families. That's what a parish is, a family of families. And so you have the leadership role within your family, you automatically then have a leadership role, a life role within the mission, the ministries of your parish family. There's another type, and that is what are generally called positional or organizational leadership. And this is temporary, it might last a long time, but nevertheless, it's temporary. It's not permanent or enduring the way a life role leadership uh, position is, but this is positional, it's, it's organizational. It's, it's uh, being the, um, uh, the chair of a committee, it's being the CEO, the CFO, the COO, uh, whatever. It, um, it, it's, it's those things that come from the position. A bishop has positional or organizational uh, leadership or authority. Um, uh, it, it's temporary, uh, it will end at some point for me and someone else will take over that position here as chief shepherd of, of the diocese. Our pastors have the positional, organizational. Finally, there is a group that I'm just calling personal. And we recognize this by the, the, the person that's the go-to guy. You know, you've got something that needs to be done, whether it's at work or within r your relationships, your families, or, or in the parish. And usually the pastor's pretty good. He, he knows you've got something to be done. Let's ask her to do it. Let's ask him. It, it's a personal style of leadership. And you're going to go to that person and say, would you get involved in this? We need somebody to give this direction. So there's a sense of leadership that belongs to the very being of, of someone. It's just who they are. And they're able to exercise that in a positive and effective way. In the Gospels, we see both, we see all of these uh, types of leadership. You have there the upper picture, there's Pontius Pilate, and it's the trial uh, of our Lord. <clears throat> and, and Pilate there, as a representative, the governor the, of the uh, imperial government of Rome, uh, you have King Herod having the royal positional or organizational uh, authority. And you've got down the below there the, the, the Sanhedrin, uh, those who are the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. All of those people have positional authority or organizational authority in the Gospels. 
But if you look closely at that picture, and if you read the 18th and 19th chapter of St. John's Gospel, which is the trial of Jesus before Pilate, you really have to ask yourself, as John narrates that sad experience, who really is on trial? Pilate is out, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you would have no power over me if it had not been given from above. And in the end, he, Pilate asked, what is truth? What is truth? It's really Pilate who's squirming and under judgment in that encounter. Jesus has personal authority, personal leadership in the portrayal of the Gospels. So it's really in John's Gospel, Pilate who is under judgment when he's in the presence of the condemned Jesus of Nazareth. The phrase servant leadership, while it has been always talked about by Christian authors as the style of our Lord's, really was coined by an, an author, a, a, a business um, uh, type who, who wrote about and studied, analyzed uh, business uh, effectiveness uh, by the name of uh, Robert Greenleaf. And he wrote an essay in 1970, it eventually became a book, and he wrote several books, but he's kind of the footnote to this phrase, which was coined in his essay in 1970 of servant leadership. But it was done not in the context of church, but in the context of business administration. And it's interesting, he was saying, what are the real qualities that bring about an effective business leader? Well, it's someone who acts with integrity, who builds a level of trust with those he works with or she works with, uh, who helps the others to grow and shapes the destinies of those people by going out ahead and showing the way, not just pointing it or setting the direction, but actually living into the direction that the leader wants to take the organization or the, the group or the individual. So servant leadership was coined by this man, Robert uh, Greenleaf. Um, and uh, notice his, his main thing about shaping destinies is that those who are served by a servant leader are most likely themselves to become servant leaders. That's one of his goals, it, uh, that the servant leader will form others to become servant leaders. And think of what Jesus said at Matthew 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am meek and gentle of heart. I want you to learn this heart part of leadership, this meekness, this gentleness. Uh, learn it from me. So Jesus was teaching leadership, but a style that we call servant leadership. The test of a servant leader is do those being served grow as persons? Do they become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, less dependent? Many leaders make those others more dependent upon them. Something can happen in families. Huh? The father can make, make the family very dependent upon, but the idea is to help the autonomy, that the, the genuine independence of children and others in general uh, to, to flourish. To, to, uh, to come to fruition? And are they likely themselves to want to become servant leaders? Two little descriptions, I would say, of, of leadership that we might consider. Uh, and really, the second one is the one we're going to break apart. And the first one is, of course, leadership is an influence process. We said that influencing someone's thinking or behavior development through which someone motivates others toward a common goal or a shared vision. Um, for Jesus, the common goal is the kingdom of God. It's the will of his Father leading us in that direction to uh, place our wills in obedience to the will of God. The other description, which is the one we're going to focus on more, is the ability to take people where they would not go on their own. The ability to take people where they would not go on their own. There are two parts, obviously, to that description or definition. First of all, the ability to take people. Leadership is a process, obviously, of influencing others. So it necessarily involves some power or some kind of authority. 
And I want to look at those, because those are very important, I think, when we try to examine or analyze the style or the example of our Lord's leadership. How did he use power? What's the purpose of authority in the gospel, in the lives of a disciple of Christ? And first of all, it's a power that we've already seen. If, if it's for the growth, the de development, the authentic autonomy of another person, then it's got to be a power that doesn't just control uh, or compel, but a power that empowers those who are under our leadership, empowers others, a quality, an important, essential quality of servant leadership. And then the second part of the definition, to take others where they would not go on their own. The leader must have a vision, a goal, some truth that he or she holds out and is committed to, and then the leader becomes the catalyst in moving others toward that vision, toward that goal, toward that truth. Um, but he's only the catalyst, or she, the catalyst. Um, the challenge always is to balance this visionary, the idealist aspect of leadership with the practical and the realist. I think we've all met met folks, some, some who are so visionary that they, they really can't, can't move others toward that vision. The, the, the practical, the concrete uh, elements that are necessary are, are beyond them. They, they've got some vision, they've, they've got a goal in mind, but they can't move to the next step and the next step to get there. They're, they're just so much of a vision. And on the other hand, we can be such a practical realist to say that we don't even consider well, that, that vision, that idea, that truth is impossible. Right? We, we judge it by a, 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 what we would call a realism or a practicality that eliminates the vision, eliminates. And I think that happens very often in, in our lives. We take the ideals of, uh, of the gospel and say that's never going to happen, right? not this side of heaven. Uh, but it is, it is the goal, it is the, the, the truth toward which we should be living. Uh, and working and leading. So, um, we're gonna have a consideration here of, of this idea of power and authority because they're essential to any kind of leadership. Abe Lincoln said, if you want to test a man's character, give him some power. If you want to test somebody's character, give him a little power and see what he does with it, talking to his son there. Um, the, the, the one uh, author who, although five centuries ago, uh, wrote on the use of power or authority and is still, even within the last two or three years, six books were written uh, on his uh, classic work on authority or power, is an Italian, a Florentine by the name of Niccolo Machiavelli. And uh, in 1513, he wrote a book called Il Principe, The Prince, I think the leader, huh? In, in the context of the 16th century of uh, Italy. By age 29, Niccolo Machiavelli uh, was a wealthy bureaucrat in Florence. He was really doing well. But he became, what we might say, downsized when the Medicis came back into power in Florence. And so, being unemployed, uh, Machiavelli had time to think about what had happened to him, the power of the very wealthy uh, Medici family, and his unemployment gave him time to write this book, a basic text on how to gain, use, and hold power. How to get it, how to use it, how to keep it. And uh, it, it's, it's a classic, it, it, you've certainly heard, in fact, his, his name has become an adjective. You could say that's something as Machiave Machiavellian uh, is not a compliment. Uh, it's someone who's rather ruthless uh, to get what he or she wants. And so his principle is get what you want however you can. That's a form of leadership, huh? using power to compel um, it's expediency over morality. Uh, what I want is what I want to get, and it doesn't matter whether it's, it's right or wrong. Rather, I'm going to use the power that I have to get done 
what you want done. I'm going to use it to get what, what I want. And so, so rather than having to motivate people to follow, to help them see the wisdom of the direction you'd like to go and buy into it, what you need to do is really just coerce others. Uh, it's not a matter, it's not important to motivate, you just get them to do what you want through coercion. This is his idea of uh, the use of power, getting it, keeping it, and, uh, hold, and using it. Um, what I'd like to do is to look at a totally diametrically opposed idea, and that is what the Gospels and the New Testament reveal to us about power and authority, the power of Christ and the power that you and I have in our, our daily lives. There are different words. Um, just as you know, the Greek is uh, very rich, uh, more so than in many ways than our English vocabulary. For instance, we have one word for love, and we might love a pet, we love a spouse and children, we love God, and we love ice cream. Same word for all those very diverse uh, meanings. Well, the Greeks uh, and the Greek New Testament uses different words for power and authority, and I'd like to examine them with you because I think it's, uh, it's instructive. The very first is the word dunamis, dunamis. We're gonna look at each of these. Uh, the second word in the New Testament for power or authority is energeia. Energeia. You can see these are the roots of some very common English words, these Greek uh, nouns. And finally, there is a type of power that's called exousia. Exousia. Those three words are found in the New Testament, and they translate usually, depending on the version of the Bible you're reading, as power or authority. But they have very diverse meanings. The first one, dunamis, get our English words dynamite, dynamic, from there. Dunamis refers to a personal strength. Uh, um, uh, someone's ability, someone's power that's invested in their persons. I think examples of dunamis in current uh, society would be our celebrities, uh, people who have that magnetism, a certain attraction. Athletes certainly have dunamis. They have this ability in a particular sport. They have this ability to act or perform or sing or what have you in terms of celebrities. Uh, that's examples of a dunamis. Um, in the Gospels, uh, when others describe uh, the works of Jesus, um, they uh, use the word uh, this Greek word dunamis. Uh, for instance, Mark 6, uh, 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 verse 14, um, Herod is speaking here. So these are the words of Herod in Mark's gospel, and uh, they're marveling over the deeds that Jesus is performing. And, uh, jo and Herod says, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. Now remember, he's guilty about this because he had him beheaded. John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that's why mighty power is at work in him. Mighty power is at work in him. See, the things he's doing, uh, the dynamic actions of Jesus. So Herod describes them with that word dunamis. Dunamis, the word for power, mighty power. The, the second word, energeia, and we get our words, obviously, energy or energetic uh, from uh, the Greek word energeia, is more precisely than a personal power of magnetism or strength personally, it's the power to change things, to influence other things, to make things happen. And maybe an example today would be a, someone who's a great military leader, uh, a corporate executive, somebody who can shake things up and, and make change. Um, St. Paul uses the word energeia often in his letters, and he uses them to describe supernatural power, either of God or of the devil. It's interesting, but, uh, but so he, he admits that the power of evil uh, is, is energeia. Uh, it can make things happen. It can change things in the world. Um, that's the second New Testament word for power or authority, dunamis, energeia. And then the third one, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's, uh, uh, yeah, e e exousia, the, the, the third uh, one. And you, you might recognize in that it, 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 the Greek word itself is a compound word, ex meaning out of or from, 
And usia is, is being, one's very being. Um, you might remember the, 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 from the Council of Nicaea when the, the, the fathers there, the early bishops in the fourth century, 325, were struggling with how do we talk about Jesus? You know, how, how, do we, how do we articulate the mystery of, as Father was saying earlier, uh, one divine person with two natures? And how is he related to the Father? And we don't have two or three gods, but one God. And the word that is used in Nicaea, in the Council of Nicaea, we translate it now as we say the creed, consubstantial with the Father. It's homo usias, homo the same, and usias being. Okay, the same being with the Father, one in being or consubstantial with the Father. So this power, exousia, is, is not from one's personal strengths or skills, um, and, and it's often found in people who uh, appear to be frail, uh, unimportant, uh, or, or weak. Uh, now, I think this is very important to recognize this, uh, these, these three different words, because what did Israel expect for the coming of the Messiah, the leader of leaders, the anointed one? They were in a posture of looking for someone who would be the Terminator, huh? uh, the Superman, the one greater than Caesar. Right? He would have all energia and dunamis. That's exactly what the people were expecting regarding the Messiah. Gonna come in and change things, you're gonna make things happen and they're gonna exude uh, they're, they're going to be his skills, his power, like the grand celebrity. They were looking for the Superman, the Messiah, the, uh, the Christ, the anointed one. This is the popular expectation. And what did they get? A baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Not dunamis, not energeia, but exousia. Babies have exousia. Think of this, you know, in a, a re situations repeated many, many times in a family. A 19-year-old um, daughter comes home and says, Mom and Dad, I'm pregnant. Uh, not married and come back from college, I'm pregnant. And that's liable to tip the scales in terms of some pretty harsh words, maybe some judgment. Um, how could you? You've let us down. All, all kinds of friction, maybe tension within the home. But generally, no matter how bitter or how difficult that initial time is, when that baby comes, <laughs> it's a matter of loving, uh, loving that child on everyone's part. That's exousia. That's exousia. From the very being of that newborn person, there's a power, a power that goes out to change hearts, to change minds, to elicit love, to elicit compassion. That's, that's exousia. Jesus uses this word exousia almost exclusively for his own power or his authority. It's something that comes from his very being. The good example there is Matthew, Matthew 9, uh, verse 6. But that you may know that the Son of Man has, this is, by the way, Matthew 9 is the story of the healing of the paralytic. And, uh, uh, and they're, they're marveling at that and criticizing our Lord. And then he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, rise, take up your bed and go home. He had told the young man, your sins are forgiven. And that's what caused the, the, those who had positional leadership, organizational authority to criticize Jesus. Only God can forgive sins. And so Jesus responds by explaining with, and in the Gospel of Matthew, the word is exousia, that the Son of Man has authority that comes out of his very being. Um, the evangelists use exousia for what others observe in Jesus' teaching and actions. Others who are not opposed to him, the other, Herod saw, um, uh, what, dunamis, but uh, those who are open, who are disciples, see exousia in it. So, so Matthew 7, uh, verse 29, he was teaching them 
as one having authority and not like their scribes, right? not like those who had only positional or organizational authority, but his authority came from inside, came from the very foundation of who he is. A, a second quote there, the very beginning of Mark's uh, gospel, um, they are uh, in the uh, synagogue uh, at Capernaum, and our Lord had just uh, healed a, an unclean, a man with an unclean spirit. So he's exercised that, that demonic spirit. And uh, uh, Mark tells us that they were all amazed so that they debated among, them say, say, uh, among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even unclean spirits and they obey him. Right? A new teaching with authority comparing it to the others who teach them, and it's, it's, it's not at all the same. Now, this word authority, I, I think, is helpful to know its root, our English word authority. The Latin word sounds very much like it, octoritas, octoritas, and that comes from a Latin verb, augeo, auxi octus, it's, it's a somewhat defective verb, um, but uh, it, its meaning means to make grow to increase, and of course we get our English word augment from augeo. Uh, so the meaning of the word, the root meaning of the word, the Latin word for authority is something that makes grow, increases, augments. I think the very word itself, even though it's very often contradicted, the root of the word means that authority is given to someone so that others can grow, others can increase, Others' lives can be augmented, expanded, uh, made fuller. Uh, the very meaning of the word authority is that. Uh, and yet, we've all experienced a misuse, probably, of authority somewhere in our lives, where authority was used to demean, to reduce, um, uh, to push into the ground, um, rather than to help grow. Um, but the very meaning of our English word has that root. It's, it's the purpose for all genuine authority, to grow, to increase, to augment. And, and so this servant leadership that we're going to, uh, uh, that we're considering here, um, is um, uh, that the way of Jesus, the only type of leadership that he modeled and that he teaches or proposes for uh, his disciples. So um, what I'd like to uh, say is, is this word, we're using the word leader here, and I haven't used it yet from any of the Gospels, and that's because in general, the word leader, the Greek word in the New Testament for leader, is used pretty much in a negative connotation. Um, just two, three, two examples here for you. Luke 19, um, uh, it's after the cleansing of the temple. In St. Luke's Gospel, our Lord has driven out the money changers and those selling the, the sacrificial animals and things. Um, and uh, Luke 19, 47, uh, St. Luke writes, and every day he was teaching in the temple area, the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people, meanwhile, were seeking to put him to death. Those in positional or organizational authority are, are colliding with the one who has personal authority because it is exousia, and theirs is energia or dunamis. But the word leader there is generally, as it is there in Luke 19, used in a negative fashion. Acts 3, 17, now I know, brothers, that you acted out of ignorance just as your leaders did. This is the uh, sermon or the speech by uh, St. Peter after Pentecost. Uh, in Acts chapter 3. And it's interesting, the Greek word for leader is protos. Protos, we get our uh, meaning first in rank or influence or honor. Um, and, and so it all has to do with positional authority, you know. Uh, first in rank, first in influence, first in honor. Protos, we get prototype, those things that are the beginning, uh, the, the very first model of something. Um, that, and so the, the Greek word for leader is pretty much used uh, in a negative fashion in the Gospels because they are interested in preserving their rank, uh, preserving or increasing their influence with the people. And that's part of the rub with Jesus. He has too many followers. He's becoming too popular. What about our influence? 
So someone who's in a positional or organizational uh, 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 leadership who is interested solely in their importance, called pedestal leadership, if, that, if that's what's uh, fascinating you or drawing you to leadership, then you're always afraid that someone will exceed your rank, have more influence, get more honor. It becomes a tyranny of competition if that's the kind of leadership that you want to exercise. Whereas Jesus had none of that, but the leaders of the people had all of it. Now, because the word leader is used negatively, then we don't find the word for our Lord teaching on how to be a leader. Rather, what you find in the New Testament are biblical images for leadership. And there are multiple, but I, I just chose three here. So we don't see the word protos, as Jesus saying, I want you to be perfect. He said, I don't want you to be first, I want you to be last. Huh? If, you want to be a, if you want to be the greatest, then you've got to take the last place and serve all the others. So there are three images that our Lord uses frequently for leadership. And the first is that of shepherd. Right? John 10, we know that very well, the I am statements of our Lord. Um, and he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Right? The bad shepherd, the inauthentic shepherd runs away when the flock is threatened because they're interested in their own security, their own welfare. But the good shepherd lays down his life. The good shepherd is a servant to the very end. John 21, uh, and this is the uh, threefold rehabilitation of St. Peter after his threefold denial in the courtyard during our Lord's Passion, there by the Sea of Galilee, and three times our Lord asks Peter, do you love me? And Peter responds that he does, and then each time our Lord says, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my lambs. And so he's calling Peter, who is the leader, who will be the prince of the apostles, the rock on which the church is built. He will become the first bishop of Rome, but he's inviting him to be shepherd. Uh, feed my lambs, feed, tend my sheep. And finally, First uh, Peter, he himself in, the, in his first letter in the New Testament chapter 5, uses the image uh, when he's talking to fellow elders. It's an exhortation to elders of the church, and he says to them, tend the flock of God. This is what Jesus told him, and now he's telling other leaders under the image of shepherd, not lording it over those assigned to you. Be a servant of those you lead as a shepherd of the flock of God. So the image of shepherd is one of the biblical images. A second one that our Lord uses instead of the word leader is the word steward. And we find in a number of the parables our Lord talks about a steward, either a good steward or a bad steward, good leader or a bad leader. And one in particular, uh, Luke 12, uh, where our Lord says, who is that faithful and prudent steward whom the master will put in charge? The leader, who, who is that leader? Faithful and prudent leader whom the master will put in charge. So um, there again is the second biblical gospel image that our Lord uses, the word steward. And besides shepherd and steward, there is the word servant, which our Lord uses uh, of himself and challenges his disciples uh, to become. Matthew 20, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give to give his life uh, for the others. And finally, uh, Luke 22, let the greatest among you, this is where uh, uh, they're um, arguing about who's the greatest, who's the protos, hmm? which, which of us is protos? And our Lord won't have that conversation, so he short circuits it, and he says, let the greatest among you be the youngest, and let the leader be as a servant. This is the the translation of the New American Bible. Not all translations would use the word leader there, but, but um, let, let the first be as the servant. So, so those are the three images that you can look to as you're reading the New Testament and substitute the word leader for shepherd, for steward, for servant. In the book of uh, Proverbs, the uh, uh, wisdom literature of the Old Testament, uh, it is said there wisely, where there is no vision, the people perish. And that was a criticism of the leadership of Israel at times. Uh, they had no vision. They weren't leading the people with the covenant uh, in mind. Uh, 
and therefore the people will perish. And so in, in the light of that uh, wisdom saying from the book of Proverbs, um, the leader is the one who is the keeper of the vision right? in, in a family, um, in the diocese, in wherever, the, the, the workplace. The speaker of the vision, you have to be able to uh, articulate it and, and describe it. And finally, in one's own person, models the vision. Not just again pointing, it's out there, but it's gotta be in here, and I have to be an example of where I'm leading uh, my family, uh, spouse, whomever. Uh, and, and therefore, you might say, the, the leader must know the way, as a keeper of the vision, he must show the way personally and must model the vision by going the way. Those are all. By the way, I forgot, did everybody get a hand? There is a handout, a two-page, one, one sheet, but two-sided uh, uh, outline of, of the talk. There were just too many to do a slide outline for this, but at least they, you have something there. I hope if you didn't get it, there might be extras in the back if you didn't get one when you came in. Um, finally, I want to conclude. We have, we have uh, 15 minutes, I think, to, the, to our conclusion. And I'd like to take those final minutes of looking at these five aspects of uh, servant leadership. That part of the um, um, definition or description of leadership that uh, it's, it's the influence on others, taking others where they wouldn't go on their own. So what does it take to take others where they would not go on their own? And I'm su suggesting these five qualities. We'll look at each one of them. Self-awareness, uh, internal anchors, uh, a love greater than your fears, a willingness to do difficult things, and leadership starts as we began at the beginning with my heart. Um, so let's, let's look at these. Um, Self-awareness, uh, any good leader, any authentic uh, leader will know himself or, or herself. Um, what, what are my um, blind spots? Huh? Uh, what, what are my... Um, uh, weaknesses and, and to know to know them and to be dealing with them to to address them and, and that means to cultivate the habit of self-reflection and lifelong learning understanding that self-awareness uh, is never uh, ever a finished product we're always growing and we sometimes we have the greatest capacity to surprise ourselves even when we think we knew ourselves so well but we get into a situation where what we do or say or don't do or don't say is a surprise even to ourselves. And so we're always growing in this attribute of, of, of uh, self-awareness. Uh, but if you don't have this, um, it, it's been said regarding the, the leader as the keeper and the speaker and the uh, model of the vision that either you have a plan, or you have a vision, or you become a part of someone else's plan. If you don't have a clear plan, then you become a part of someone else's plan. And guess what they have planned for you? Not much. <laughs> so we've got to have this, and, and, and through self-awareness, we keep focused on, uh, on it. It's only when we're clear where we're headed can we pursue energetically the vision and inspire others to uh, follow and to pursue it, to, to, to pursue it also. So, so self-awareness. Self um, the, the, uh, of course, our Lord addressed that idea of uh, being aware of our own weaknesses. He used the image of the splinter. Remember Matthew 7? He said, um, regarding our blind spots, and he said, um, uh, you know, you, you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but you're, you're forgetting the plank uh, in your own eye. So that's all about being self-aware, knowing who we are, our strengths, as well as our weaknesses. The, the second uh, quality that I would, would point out uh, is, is that of um, uh, internal anchors. And I like that phrase. I, I came upon it some years ago um, uh, in a little book called Jesus as CEO. And uh, they talked about uh, the need to have internal anchors, to know your non-negotiables. Yeah. What is it? Where's the hill that I'm gonna die on? We can't die on every hill but we do have to have those areas where there are principles and values that I won't abandon, that I, I'll stick with, come, as they say, hell or high water. This is who I am, this is where I must be. So the non-negotiable principles in our lives. And in order to um, 
stand by those, those internal anchors, then we need these personal virtues by grace, by the gifts of the spirit of, of integrity, like a wholeness of life. What's inside of me is evident on outside, and what's outside consists, is consistent with what's inside of me. And that's, that's true holiness, huh? integrity, oneness, uh, trust in God. Uh, all, all of these things are, are part of having uh, internal, uh, internal anchors. Um, you know, there, there's that phrase that a lot of people, oh, whatever. <laughs> it's like, uh, it, it's, it's a kind of very dangerous um, indifference. And the spiritual writers through the centuries talk about indifference, not in the sense that I don't care about anything. When someone says, oh, whatever, it means I don't, I don't really care about that. Uh, but indifference is that I'm not so attached to something as not to be open to something that might correct or help me grow. Uh, and that, that's another challenge, I think, for all of us as, as leaders. But we need these internal, internal anchors. A love greater than your fears. Sometimes people think that you know, a, a great leader is somebody who doesn't fear anything. Uh, in fact, uh, they would be uh, at home with Machiavelli's idea to be feared is safer than to be loved. That's true, probably. Love, love can change. But if you got somebody fearing your authority, um, they're going to probably kowtow to uh, your wishes. And that's part of his principle, expediency over morality. To be feared is safer. But the servant leadership is diametrically opposed. It's based on my love of God, God's love for me, and my love for all others. And so our Lord says, it's said that the third most frequent besides loving God and loving our neighbor is the command not to be afraid. And we're not, not to be afraid as we go through uh, the journey uh, of life. Um, motivated by a love of God, a love of others uh, that acts even when we are fearful. So it's false to think that we can get so strong that we have nothing that we're afraid of. Um, but even when we are fearful of something, to be able to act motivated by a love of God and a love of others. Um, and uh, of course, that, that is enhanced when the environment, if it's, if it's the family, if it's the workplace, if it's the parish, if it's the neighborhood, when that environment is one of loyalty, affection, and mutual support. If, if those are qualities that dominate in a community, loyalty, affection, mutual support, then uh, that motivation to act, even when there are fears, uh, becomes even, even stronger. Um, the fourth is a willingness to do the difficult things. Every leader uh, in any context has to be uh, willing to do the difficult things. We all, to some extent, but there are some who suffer in a great extent from what you can call the approval addiction where we're vulnerable to others' opinions. Now, we all want, generally, others to have a good opinion of us, and that, that's part, I think, of, uh, of human nature, but it can be pushed to an extreme and become an addiction for approval. Uh, there's a, a joke about the, the priest. He was uh, shaking hands after a Sunday mass, and a, a person came up and said, Father, that was the best homily I ever heard you give. And the priest said, what was the matter with all the others? I mean, in fact, he needed that approval for everything that he preached. Uh, so, so we can all suffer from this uh, uh, approval uh, addiction. But it's, it's almost a pathological need to be approved. Um, and, and what happens then is that you're not going to do anything that will step on toes. You're not going to do anything that's going to uh, disturb uh, anyone. And I, I say this both to you who are fathers, to you who are in your families as husbands. Um, tolerance is often underneath a lack of courage. To lack of courage often masquerades in our society as tolerance. You, know, you really don't like something. You really want to correct that. But you stay quiet because you just don't want to upset the apple cart. You want peace at any cost. Uh, you want approval. And so you dare not address a problem, dare not correct a mistake or an error or a sin. Uh, that, that, but the, the sign of a, a real leader is someone who it, it can certainly be tolerant, but not a lack of courage masquerading as tolerance. 
um, to avoid doing the difficult things compromises leadership at every, at every level. And sometimes leaders use others to do their, their, their dirty work. Um, it's easy for a bishop to do that. Um, but I, I've always had my 15 years, it just was 15 uh, last month, um, if a priest is in a situation where something has to be addressed, um, I, 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 I almost never I, uh, delegate the vicar general or the vicar for clergy. Yeah, that's, that's my, I'm, I'm a father and brother of, of my priests. And it'd be very easy not to want to do that difficult thing and to let someone else do that work. Uh, but I think it's incumbent upon the bishop as father and brother uh, to address the situation. Um, tolerance is not uh, uh, allowable in, in, that, in, in those situations, but never use others to do your dirty work as a, as a leader. An example of that, it always comes to my mind regarding uh, is David and Uriah. Remember, David fell in love with this uh, beautiful Bathsheba, only to find out that she's married, and she's married to one of his generals, Uriah. And uh, so rather than uh, face the situation, and then Bathsheba comes and she's uh, with child, she's pregnant. So uh, what does uh, David do but has Uriah, he plots to have Uriah killed in battle. Uh, so he uses others, his other generals, to set Uriah up and then withdraw. And Uriah's on the front line and he's, he's killed. Rather than facing the problem, admitting, admitting the situation and working it out, but it's a, I think it's a good example of using others to do, David, the great king and leader of Israel, uh, using others to do his dirty work and to cover for his own sinfulness. Uh, and the final one is uh, that um, um, leadership starts uh, with our heart. Uh, if, if we are going to be those ones, if, uh, as, as Jesus invites us to be servant leaders, uh, then that question where Jesus said uh, that he came to serve and not to be served is a question we have to ask uh, ourselves in our own hearts and according to our conscience. Am I here to serve? Or in how many situations do I insist on being served? Um, I, I like this uh, definition of, uh, of ego, and that is edging God out. Um, if, 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 uh, if I edge God out of my heart, uh, then I'm filled with myself. We're going to hear today in the parable that our Lord tells in uh, Luke chapter 18 of the two men who go up to pray in the temple. And the uh, Pharisee has certainly edged God out of his heart. In fact, Luke describes it. He's, he says this prayer to himself. It's very clear, as our Lord tells the parable, that the Pharisee says this prayer to himself uh, because he's always talking about his hands are full of himself. His heart is full of himself. His heart is full of his ego. And uh, uh, when that happens, then God is put on the margins or pushed over the edge. And I like C.S. Lewis um, in, I think, Mere Christianity, talked about humility. And he said, you know, humility doesn't mean I have to think less of myself. We, we have to be honest. We don't think less of ourselves, and that's humility. But rather, humility is thinking of ourselves less, you know, not, not being preoccupied with my agenda, my needs, my wants, but rather um, others. So not thinking less of myself. God doesn't want us to do that, but he does want us to think of ourselves less. And then finally, let Christ who leads me be visible uh, through my words and my actions. Once again, that's that integrity, the, the, the true holding. Why do, why do we remember the saints that we honor? Uh, because their holiness was visible, their consistency, their integrity. Uh, what they said and did is who they were. And, and that oneness of life uh, made them great leaders in whatever capacities they had. Uh, some were kings and queens, uh, others were homeless, but they were all leaders uh, for the kingdom of God. And they used uh, that authority of their discipleship of Jesus Christ uh, to lead others through their words and actions because Christ was visible in their words and in their actions. And so it ought to be with us who are called to that vocation of being a saint, a holy man. And um, with that, those are the five aspects of servant leadership, uh, what it takes to bring others to go where they would not go on their own that I, I'd like to, I, I did want to consider with you today. And 
uh, with that. It's just about uh, 12.15. So thank you so very much. For being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. God bless.